Okay, how do you approach setting accounting policies for revenue? Revenue is the lifeblood of any business. It's as simple as no revenue, no business. You would think that identifying revenue would be pretty straightforward. If cash shows up in a bank account, isn't that revenue? Well, in many cases, your revenue recognition policy can be that simple, but not always. Let's say your company manufactures invisible dog fences. To date, your company has been selling its systems through the home shopping network. Revenue recognition is pretty straightforward. As you ship product to the customer, you recognize revenue. But your company wants more, more sales channels, more product diversification, more service integration, more customers, all in hopes of generating more sales. You start by selling installation and dog training services bundled with your system to provide your customer with a turnkey solution to roaming pooches. To address buyer remorse, the company offers an extended warranty for as long as the dog shall live, a 90-day money-back guarantee, and a financing plan to boot, all for the incredibly low price of $9.99 a month. I'm tempted to buy a dog. Now figure out the revenue you should report as you sell each of these systems. Not so easy to do using simple logic anymore which means we need to consult the gods of accounting standards for guidance. The purpose of this video is not to answer this question for you, but to coach you in finding an answer for yourself. First, you need to know your basis of accounting to determine in which part of the handbook you are going to look. You need to be intimately familiar with the handbook and its structure so that it becomes second nature. Under IFRS, the standards are embodied in IAS 18 Revenue and IAS 11 Construction Contracts. In ASPE, revenue is dealt with in Section 3400. For nonprofit organizations, revenue is dealt with in Part 3 of the Handbook Section 4410. Let's start with IAS 18, and the underlying principle of this section is that revenue should be recorded based on the substance and not the form of the transaction. This means looking beyond the simple flow of goods and services and the money to pay for them, these may have no bearing on the revenue recognition policy. IAS 18 breaks up different revenue transactions into three buckets. Bucket number one is for the revenues generated from the sale of goods. Bucket number two is for the revenues generated from the sale of services. And bucket number three is reserved for revenues associated with income we generate from letting others use our assets. Think leasing, lending, licensing, for example. Each of these buckets have specific criteria that need to be considered. You need to understand these criteria well and reference them in your analysis. The terminology is important, so don't make up your analysis. Look at the criteria and incorporate it accordingly with the case facts before drafting your accounting policy. The professional judgment is in the interpretation of these criteria. So note for example that the standard provides further discussion on how you should think about reliable measurement. You don't need to memorize these criteria, understand them, know that they exist and how to reference them quickly. There are all sorts of revenue schemes discussed in this section. And because revenue is so fundamental to a business, you can expect to be confronted with revenue issues on a regular basis throughout the professional program and your career. To answer our dog system revenue recognition policy decision, we will need to consider multiple element transactions and separately identifiable components. Don't know what these are? Look them up. Another tricky revenue recognition situation is when transactions don't involve money. In this case, not only is identifying the issue often missed by students, but dealing with the measurement aspects can also be complex. For long-term contracts and service contracts, international standards require the percentage completion basis of accounting. Recognizing the method is only half the battle though. You need to understand how to apply it, and the standard provides you with guidance on the different bases for matching costs with revenues. Let's skip over to ASPE for a moment. In principle, this section aligns with the international standards, but there are always nuances you need to be familiar with. Note that once again we have specific criteria to apply to the sale of goods, 
but the criteria are different than they were under IFRS. That doesn't necessarily mean a different outcome, but it absolutely means a different analysis. Look it up and make sure your analysis uses the right criteria. Don't wing it, just do it. Also note that ASPE doesn't have a separate section for construction contracts. It once again references the percentage completion method, but it also permits the use of the completed contract method, which is something that isn't in international standards. Timing of revenue recognition is a key issue for long-term contracts. So anytime you see a long-term contract, ask yourself how much revenue can be recognized up front and how much should be recognized over the life of the contract. While the conceptual frameworks between IFRS and ASPE are largely the same, there are occasional nuances that can trip you up in your analysis if you aren't careful. ASPE also discusses the possibility of using the installment method for revenue recognition when there is significant collection uncertainty. So watch out for customers that lack creditworthiness, which will be evidenced by worsening aged receivable listings and high bad debt expenses. Disclosure and presentation is pretty straightforward, but you'll also need to watch for the whole gross versus net reporting of revenues. Businesses that operate by selling products and services on behalf of others earn a net commission, which is a tiny piece of the overall transaction revenue. There's no impact on the bottom line, but your income statement looks much different depending on whether the salesperson acts as an agent or as a principal. Finally, let's flip over to part three of the handbook for a moment to look at the revenue recognition in the nonprofit organization context. The big difference between the for-profit and the not-for-profit world is that revenue recognition is reversed. In the for-profit world, we are always striving to match cost with revenue. But in the not-for-profit world, we do just the opposite. We select revenue recognition policies that in essence match revenue with cost. So for example, if we get a grant to deliver a program to help handicapped pets, but we don't actually develop the program until next year, the grant revenue would need to be deferred and recognized in a way that matches the grant contribution to the program cost. There are two methods for accounting for contribution revenues. The deferral method is conceptually a little simpler to understand. In our example, the contribution revenue would need to be deferred as a liability on the balance sheet until the program costs are incurred and then brought into the operating statement together. The other method is the restricted fund method. And this requires setting up a separate fund based on the restrictions associated with each contribution. The general fund is set up to handle the unrestricted contributions and the general administrative expenses of the nonprofit organization. So the grant money received for our handicapped pet program would be recorded in a separate restricted fund. In the year the funds are received, the revenue would be recognized in this restricted fund. Then in the subsequent year, all the costs associated with delivering the program will be charged against this restricted fund, which enables the appropriate matching of the contribution with the program cost. The advantage of using the restricted fund method is that it makes it plain and clear as to what restricted funds have been received and dispersed rather than having them all reported as one statement, as would be the case if we used the deferral method. The disadvantage is the complexity created by having multiple funds within the same nonprofit organization. The other item that comes up from time to time pertains to the donation of goods and services from volunteers and patrons of the nonprofit organization. Once again, we need to determine whether we should record such donations, and if we do, at what amount? Go to Handbook 4410, Paragraph 16 for guidance. So there you have it, an overview of accounting for revenue. To summarize your approach, first, consider the relevant basis of GAAP, whether it's international standards, private entity standards, or nonprofit organization standards. Next, identify the nature of the revenue recognition issue. Is it a timing issue? Is it a measurement issue? Is it a recognition issue? Thirdly, and very importantly, apply applicable guidance to the situational facts to develop deep analysis. Now you are ready to conclude on your accounting policy decision based on well-documented analysis. 
Finally, consider the implications of your analysis. This decision could have broader repercussions on the financial results and metrics. There could be tax considerations. There could be management incentive compensation at stake. So take a moment to always consider the so what of your conclusion. That's all for this Get Brief tutorial. Post and answer any questions you or others have on this topic.